Hi, I am Kate Greer, and I am in Dr. Carter's African Studies 421 class, and this is my midterm. The midterm prompt was to tell the story of African Americans in Paris from the turn of the 20th century until Nazi occupation. Please detail the presence ensuing your discussion minimally, the following individuals, activities, and the proper order and time sequence. So that was our prompt. Um, some important dates are World War I was from July 28, 1914 to November 11, 1918. The Great Depression was from October 29, 1929 until 1939. World War II was from September 1, 1939 to September 2, 1945. First, I'm going to start with Henry Oswa Tanner. He was born June 21, 19, I'm sorry, 1859 and died May 25, 1937. He was an American artist who was the first African American painter to become internationally famous. In 1891, he moved to Paris and was so welcomed by the French people that he decided to stay there. Since he was so accepted into the community, he began to make some really good connections. His work even ended up in the Salon, which was very well known as one of the greatest art exhibitions in Paris. It was a huge honor that his work made it. He came from a very hardworking African American family whose mother escaped slavery by the Underground Railroad. Their family had a lot of connections to some very powerful and influential slaves, such as Frederick Douglass, who was a very well known for his slave narrative and anti-slavery support. While in Paris, he became very well connected to some very well known artists, such as Gustave Corbett, Jean Baptiste Chardin, and Louis Le Nain. Henry Oswa Tanner really began to make a name for himself by the late 1800s. Hundred, hundreds. He changed his work from marine scenes to religious work. One of his most famous pieces of art in 1896 were entered into the salon. It was called Daniel in the Lion's Den, which was this picture. During World War I, Henry Tanner was working hand in hand with the Red Cross Department. He was also painting images of the war, especially the front line of war. He was so highly respected by the French that in 1923, the French made him a knight of the Léon of Honor for his work as an artist. Unfortunately, Tanner passed away peacefully in the city that became his home, Paris, France, on May 25, 1937. Tanner left a very powerful legacy, though. He is still known as one of the greatest African-American painters. He is also the first African-American artist to have a painting hung in the White House. The painting is called Sandy Dunes at Sunset which was made in 1885, made of on oil canvas. And that hangs in the White House. The next person I'm going to talk about is Webb, W-E-B, Dobas, Dubas. Before Hall of Fame African Americans, his full name is William Edward Bergenhardt. He was born February 23rd, 1869, and he died August 27th, 1963. He was a very successful sociologist, historian, civil rights activist, and author. One of my other in one of my other classes, we read his book, The Soul, The Black Soul. Um, so I got to learn a lot about how important education was to him. He was very highly educated, attending the colleges of University of Berlin and Harvard. He is also the first African American to earn a doctorate. He was very influential in the movement of equal rights for blacks. He believed that education was the key to the end of discrimination and was a very powerful advocate. He was also a world traveler, sharing his purpose through an organization fighting for independence. He made several trips to Europe, Africa, and Asia. After World War I, he found a very strong interest in African-American soldiers in France and began excuse me, to document their experiences. Just like Henry Oswald Tanner, they were both involved in the World War I documentation of African-Americans. Next, I'm going to talk about primitivism. It is mostly known as a Western art movement. It is known as a very modern it is extremely visual with a lot of color. As technology progressed in the 18th century, artists and philosophers began to explore what primitive, primitism was. 
In 1906 through 1909, Picasso, a very well-known artist, produced the Les Demonelles de Avignon. This beautiful painting. This was by Picasso. What is interesting about primitivism is that it is a Western art movement that uses inspiration and visual forms from non-Western cultures. This was the main form and development of what became known as modern art. World War I, Des Bois, after the effect to get African Americans to fight, um, is what's next. Des Bois actually supported and helped establish a camp to train African Americans as officers in the United States military. This camp caused a lot of upset from the white people as well as some African Americans. The white people felt that blacks were not qualified to be officers and the blacks felt as though this was a white man's war. The mistreatment of African Americans didn't stop there. After being promised that the United States Army would employ and give a thousand officer positions to blacks, they were once again misled and only about 250 were awarded such a position. This led to a lot of this led to a lot of protests from Du Bois. He was actually organizing a lot of these protests. In 1917, he put together a silent parade in New York. He was traveling a lot, covering the riots and the outbreak and the mistreatment of what was going on during the war. After World War One ended, Du Bois traveled back to Europe to attend the first Pan African Congress and an interview with African American soldiers. What he found was horrific and prompted him to come back to the United States and fight even more for the equal rights of African Americans. Many African Americans came back to the United States with a newfound sense of confidence. Although there was still a hostility with the whites, especially when it came to work, which led to a lot of reasons why the Red Summer in 1919 was started. It was a horrific time for racism once again. Dubas was documenting the whole thing. One of the most horrific attacks on the blacks was in Elaine, Arkansas, where almost 200 blacks were murdered for something that was a conspiracy theory about African Americans taking over their government. Dubas published a letter in the New York World stating that the only crime that was committed was standing up for themselves against the white people once again. Dubos once again rallied blacks across America to gather money to support the surviving 60 people 60 surviving blacks who were being wrongly tried and gave them the ability to have a legal defense, which worked, although there wasn't much of a victory for the African Americans in the South. This marked the first time that the federal government used the 14th Amendment. The next topic I'm going to talk about is the Hell Fighters, also known as the 369th Infantry Regime. Reg regime but it also is known as the 15th New York National Guard Regime. They were an infantry unit during World War I and World War II. They were made up of African Americans and Puerto Ricans. They were most famously known for being the first African American regime to serve with the American Expeditionary Forces during World War I. The nickname Hellfighters came from the Germans because of their toughness and that they never lost a man. The Hellfighters were a huge influence on America's viewpoint on African American soldiers and opened opportunities for soldiers of color in the future. This title, though, took a lot of hard work and they experienced a lot of mistreatment like many other African American soldiers. When they arrived, <coughs> when they arrived in France in December 1917, they were put to work during labor services instead of what they were training for, which was combat. In 1918, the U.S. assigned them to the French Army, where they didn't receive the disrespect like they did with the white soldiers. In the French Army, they were treated no differently. It was a breath of fresh air for the Hellfighters. The French appreciated them, didn't see them as less because of the color of their skin. During their time overseas, the Hellfighters saw a lot of prom propaganda aimed towards them by the Germans to stop fighting for America and to fight for Germany, because the Germans had never tried to enslave them, mistreat them, take them away from their families. This just gave the Hellfighters more pride to keep fighting for their country. In December 1918, they were brought back to New York where they were awarded two medals of honor and many distinguished services across, uh, service crosses. The most recognized man was Henry Johnson. He was recognized for his action in combat in France. They also received awards from France as well. France was extremely appreciative of the Hellfighters. 
The Hellfighters were really the first combat group of soldiers to make a difference and to get recognized for it. African American encounters with the French is the next topic. Um, African Americans during World War I were treated so differently in France that in the United than in the United States. As we have talked about in class, some people have mentioned that the French were called colorblind. They respected African Americans, although they struggled just as much as the French did during these times. Their culture was something that was interesting to the French people. It wasn't looked down upon or shamed. France was viewed by many African Americans as a safe place where they were welcomed and it was fresh. They weren't being looked down upon by racism like in the United States. This was the start to a very influential time and it also helped create jazz. It was introduced to the French and the black culture and was born in Paris. James Reese Europe is our next topic. He was born February 22nd, 1880 and died May 9th, 1919. He was one of the first jazz band leaders. He was known as the leading music man in New York in 1910. Uh, a quote, he was UB Blake called him the Martin Luther King of music. <clears throat> He fought in World War I. He was a part of the Hellfighters, actually. He was also one of the first African Americans to be a lieutenant. After the war, he and his band would travel all over Europe and perform for British, French, and American military audiences, as well as French civilians. One of their most famous quotes after returning from France was, I have come from France more firmly convinced than ever that Negroes should write Negro music. We have our own racial feelings, and if we try to copy white whites, we will make bad copies. We won France by playing music, which was ours, and not a pale imitation of theirs. And if we are to develop in America, we must develop on our own lines. He incorporated, end of quote, he incorporated this into his music by using blues and early jazz influences. Harlem in Montmartre, birth of the black community, is the next topic. After World War I, many African Americans stayed in Europe, especially Paris. They created a movement full of music, entertaining, dancing, and club scenes. This led to the Jazz Age, which included Ida Bricktop Smith and her friend Josephine Baker, who were very influential in this, wondering, in this wonderful time period right before World War II and the Great Depression. The next topic is Jazz Age. Jazz Age was a very lively time period in the 1920s before World War II. It was a time when jazz music was the tune that everyone danced to. It was influenced by pop culture and is also known in the United States as the Roaring Twenties. The birth of jazz music is credited to African Americans. From 1920 to 1933, though, in the United States was the prohibition, which was going on, which was the banning of selling and drinking alcohol. This resulted in speakeasies, which in the use became venues known to be part of the jazz age. Jazz in the United States was even played on the big radio. Big bands performed, such as James Reese, who I spoke about earlier, played on the, played on the radio a lot. The jazz age also became the entrance of women taking on a bigger role in society. Women were now taking on a larger part in the workforce, especially through dance. It became part of a lifestyle, and it wasn't so odd to see women working. Um, next is Ida Bricktop Smith, her full name being Ida Beatrice Queen Victoria Louise Virginia Smith, but she's mostly known as Bricktop. She was born August 14, 1894 and died February 1, 1985. She was an American dancer, jazz singer, and a very successful club owner. She ventured to Paris by herself, where she opened one of the most successful clubs ever, called Chez Bricktop which was open from 1929 to 1944. She was known for her free spitfire attitude and her ability to have a good time. She would host and train some of the most well-known performers, such as Josephine Baker. During World War II, she closed Bricktop and moved to Mexico City and opened a new nightclub in 1944. In 1949, she returned to Europe and started a club in Rome, Italy. She ended up retiring and returning to the States, where she didn't slow down much. She still performed late into her 80s. She passed away peacefully, though, in Manhattan in 1984. Next is Josephine Baker. Her real name is Frida Josephine McDonald. Born June 3, 1906, and died April 12, 1975. She was born in the United States, but moved to France to follow her dreams and passion as a dancer and singer. 
While she lived in the United States, she wouldn't perform for segregated audience and was a huge influence in the civil rights movement, especially in 1968. Once she moved to Paris, she was an instant star. Partnering up with Ida Bricktop, who she was extremely well known for as well for as for her dancing and singing, and was a constant performer in Bricktop. During World War II, when France declared war on Germany, she went undercover as a spy and would travel with highly important documents, and as we discussed in class, they would be sewn into her clothing. For her amazing work, she was awarded by the French Military of Honor for her contribution. When she returned back to the United States, her focus turned to civil rights activism. She was treated so differently back in the United States than when she was treated and lived in Par than how she was treated and when she lived in Paris. This propelled her to make a change, make a make a stand, make a change, and to stand up for what she believed in. She was one of the only females who spoke in the 1963 Martin Luther King speech about Negro women for civil rights. She was truly a remarkable woman who lived a fully influential life. And that is my midterm. Thank you.